Welcome back to ECMED TV, where our next guest is a somewhat controversial figure and a keynote speaker at ECMED 2015 as well. We're joined now by Professor Peter Arby, the head of the Bandim Health Project mm. from Guinea-Bissau in particular, although you are a Dane by birth, sir. Mm -hmm. So you're back in your hometown, yeah. but you've spent some 37 years living in Africa. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I was sent out 37 years ago to find out why the children were malnourished in Guinea-Bissau because mortality was 50%. So 50% of the children died before five years of age. Everyone knew at that time that it had to do, do with malnutrition because you know, it's obvious. You know, the reason that children die in low-income countries is because they're malnourished. When we came to Guinea-Bissau, we sort of got a shock because the children were not malnourished. But nonetheless, we registered uh, <coughs> uh, we, we registered a mortality of 50% the first year we were there. This is before there were any vaccinations, there were no vaccination program. But there was a severe measles epidemic which killed a lot of children. And we were able to show that it had nothing to do with malnutrition. It wasn't actually malnutrition which was a major cause. That was very controversial at that time. Mm. Uh, so we had a lot of time to find out that the real reason for the high mortality in, in measles is the intensity of exposure. It's when you have several children in the family, wh which you will have in West Africa with extended, uh, with the large extended families. So one child comes home. It's not the child who comes home, which dies, or who caught the infection outside. The child who dies is the child who are exposed at home. Uh, <coughs> no one had sort of thought about that possibility. We've shown that s systematically afterwards, and it applies, in fact, to all of the common childhood infections. The real reason, when you go back to European hi history, you can show exactly the same thing. I have shown this in UK 100 years ago, in Denmark 100 years ago, in Germany 100 years ago. So the real reason was crowding. When you had a lot of children in, uh, in, in the family, you had intensive transmission of the infection, and it's probably due to the dose of infection. You get simply too much virus, uh, and you die from infection. But at, at that time, people did not think that vaccines were particularly important, because when it's the weak children dying, we all know <laughs> that it's weak children dying, and yes. they're why vaccinated, and you're just sort of, in a sense, you're wasting the vaccine, they're just going to die of something else. So once we have found out that malnutrition was not sort of the real explanation, we started looking at, uh, we had in fact provided vaccination uh, to the community after, there were no vac general vaccination, but after, when we did our first re-examination after one year, we, uh, pr <coughs> we provided a general vaccination campaign. And from one year to the next, mortality dropped threefold in the whole community. So in a sense, I have been searching for that what was that? How could that happen? Measles is supposed to kill 10 to 15 percent of the kids. Yes. Uh, but <coughs> all the subsequent, well, there aren't that many, but there are five studies which have sort of compared a community before the introduction of measles and after the introduction of measles. Uh, <coughs> and they all show at least a 50 percent reduction in mortality when you introduce the measles vaccine. And measles vaccine, measles infection is not 50 percent of the death, nowhere near that. So <coughs> this becomes sort of a, something to search for. How, how was that possible? What was the explanation of this? So that's what I have uh, sort of used my academic life to. Um, and out of that came the idea that vaccines maybe have non-specific effects. And that's yeah, the title uh, of your keynote, non-specific effects Yeah, that's the title of the keynote. That the, <coughs> that, the, uh, that the vaccine actually stimulate the immune system or you can put it a different way, that the, the immune system is learning from the vaccine. It's learning from being stimulated. I think that one of the problems here is that we perceive our immune system as a copy machine. It, it can provide you a copy to protect you against that specific effect. Yes. But the, the immune system actually learns a lot more. And <coughs> that it's taking a long time to find out of that because you know, y your strongest Op opponents are your own assumptions. You know this cannot be possible. It, no one have thought about that. That's not possible. But we and have you've spent your career challenging those assumptions, uh, yeah. really, yeah, to find these non-specific effects of yeah. vaccines. Yeah. But it's been called a game changer. You find that a curious phrase. But you know, if if a, a vaccine has an effect, yeah. um, and then you cure the disease yeah. and stop giving the vaccines. Yeah. 
what happens then? I have been looking for that for the last 20 years. So that the implication of what I have been saying about the beneficial effect is that if you stop the vaccination, then you, will act, you may actually do more harm than you have done good because you are removing that beneficial immune, immune training. And therefore you can get a negative effect. You would get other things. These are, this is not easy to see because uh, they will be dying of other infections. They will be more susceptible or have more difficulties in handling other infections. So you won't see this immediately. But we have actually pursued this and we have uh, the only, so far in this sort of the current paradigm, the only disease which has been eradicated is smallpox. Uh, <coughs> and then you stop smallpox vaccination. Smallpox was eradicated in 1977. Yes. And then the vaccines was <coughs> stopped globally in 1980. Uh, <coughs> smallpox gives very strong scars. You and I will have uh, probably uh, I have at least, you probably yes. also have uh, <coughs> a smallpox scar. So we started reading the scars of people in, in Guinea, uh, the arms of people, and to see if having a smallpox scar or a BCG scar, the tuber tuberculosis vaccine, if that matters for the subsequent survival. And we found a huge effect. Those who had a scar had 40% lower mortality. And this is 20, sort of, this is. 25 years after the vaccination was actually stopped <coughs> and some other group uh, did a similar study in Guinea-Bissau and found exactly the same thing and they did it among uh, half of that population that did it in was HIV infected individual and also among the HIV infected individuals there was, for, there was actually 70 percent lower mortality for those who had a scar. I have just and, and your studies are vast. I mean, you've studied over 100,000 people in Guinea-Bissau. Uh, no, you, you do. That's the total population. For specific studies, you know, it, it costs a lot to collect information um, <coughs> from many people. You know. The first study of smallpox was uh, <coughs> 2,000 2, people. We have done just returned and done it in, in Denmark. But one of the things I have tried to exploit is that you know, if I find something in Guinea-Bissau which sort of contradicts the common assumption, I try to take it back to the de develop developer of the rich countries to see does that also apply in, in our setting? And we have done so, so many times now and it always fit. All the observation we made, made about malnutrition, about the many beneficial effect of measles vaccine or polio vaccine, we can find the same thing in, Guinea, uh, in, in Denmark as we have found in Guinea-Bissau. Uh, but and for smallpox, we have just um, submitted a, a, a paper which says we've analyzed the, de de <coughs> the data from Denmark, and it suggests that those who were smallpox and BCG vaccinated, you should understand that in Denmark smallpox vaccine and BCG was phased out in the, seven, in the late 70s, late 70s. Uh, early 80s. Uh, so the, the phase out of those two vaccines have more or less the same time. And since everyone had more or less the same time, I can't say this is that vaccine or that vaccine because everyone had them. Uh, but what I can say is based on this, we have taken the cohort of people born in that period and who, f who lived uh, lived through that, uh, and that's 50,000 people who lived through uh, <coughs> through that phase out, and um, there are 1,000 people who have died until now. And we have looked at did being vaccinated and non-vaccinated have anything to do with the risk of, of dying, and it does. There was a 40% lower mortality in Denmark if you were smallpox and, and BCG vaccinated. vaccinated. It, yeah. It has no effect on children who die from so uh, in this age group, these are people under forty five. Uh, you know, we're talking about people who were born in the 60s and 70s yes. who went to school and it's from their school health card we have the information on the vaccination status. There were no registers at that time which tell you who were vaccinated who and, and who, who were not vaccinated. But we were, we were lucky that the Copenhagen school registered you know, when you entered school at six or seven years of age you, had, you documented your vaccination status and you could use that uh, to sort of given that all Danes are having an ID number you can link to all the registers you can know who mo who died or who moved or yes. whatever and you can know the cause of death um, <coughs> and we have linked with those register I can therefore say that <coughs> it um, those who were smallpox vaccinated 
had 40% lower risk of dying from, from um, natural causes of diseases, whereas from accidents, suicides and murder, there's no protection. Because the vaccines yeah. have boosted immunos, immune systems. But I mean, surely the uh, ultimate... I think you should, under, you should think of it in terms of training. We are, our immune system is learning things which is used in other situations. It's just like you are not taught you're not taught all mathematical yes. cases. You learn sort of the basic principle and then you put it together whenever you are confronted with. But you kind of see the immune system as it has to learn this disease, it has to learn this disease, it has to learn this disease. That's not how it happens in the world. But the isn't, the, isn't the eradication of disease the ultimate goal of vaccinations? No, the uh, ultimate goal uh, is better survival. And this is uh, where your controversy is coming in, yeah. because you're saying, yeah. had you been a recipient of a smallpox yeah. virus yeah. in Guinea-Bissau in your yeah. studies, or indeed here in Denmark, yeah. that you would be living longer yeah. because of what had happened and as a result of the immunization. And more healthy. You would be able to control uh, much of For instance, we have shown that people who were smallpox vaccinated in Denmark had less asthma. Uh, so there are a lot of these secondary complications of modern society which probably related to not having experienced the basic diseases in, in So the Professor, the controversy that comes out of your keynote presentation, yeah. and ECMID of course is the perfect platform for you to reach a global audience, yeah. what message do you want people to walk away with from your keynote presentation, sir? we can do a lot more by actually studying the real life effect of our interventions and we can save a lot more children in low income countries and i say a lot more without thousands and thousands probably millions of children could be saved if we vaccinated correctly if we took the non-specific effect into consideration we could save a lot of money in low in high income countries we, if we actually understood with our policies are not based on truly controlled studies which show this is the best age to to, to to vaccinate we have shown in denmark that once the children get their measles vaccine in denmark then their risk of getting getting hospitalized with severe lo lower respiratory infection is 20% lower. That cost a lot of money in Denmark. So you could actually also, you could save lives in low income countries and you can save costs in high income countries. Excellent. Now you've spent 37 years sir, yeah. living in Giri Bissau. You're home in Denmark now for mm -hmm, yeah. uh, the trip back for the ECMID Congress in its own regard. Mm. Was this a shock to you when you walked in? I mean, it's massive, isn't it? This is an incredible Congress. Yeah, uh, no, no, not really a shock. It, uh, um, I've been to one of these, there was a pediatric, European Pediatric Society had a similar conference a few years ago, so I've been out here once before. But yes, coming from Guinea-Bissau, most, most things here sort of <coughs> is a total shock. There's almost more people here in the Congress than there are in Guinea-Bissau, let's be honest. No, no not quite. Not but quite, but, <laughs> but Bissau is a small place. Uh, and um, it's much more direct, much less technology. And, uh, what else are you going to be doing at the Congress, sir, apart from your keynote presentation? What are you looking to take away for yourself? Um, I rarely have time. I want to have a brush up on, 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 on several different things. Uh, I'm particular interested in, in vaccines, so there are several sessions where vaccine is the issue, so I will attend some of those. Terrific. Yeah. Well, I wish you a successful presentation, sir, a oh. great Congress, oh. and thank you for taking the time to talk to us on ECMID TV. Yeah. A real thank pleasure. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Enjoy it. Thanks.